Welcome to the Afikra Podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today we are releasing another one of our special episodes related to what's happening in Palestine. Um, with me, I have Wendy Perlman, who is a professor of political science and an interim director of Middle East and North Africa Studies program at Northwestern University in Illinois. Um, this conversation is being recorded on Wednesday, November 8th at 5.20 um, in Palestine. So just to give a context of what we know um, as of the as of recording, uh, Wendy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So um, when I told you that I wanted to talk to you on the series, I wanted to basically talk to you about two of your books in particular. Um, one came out in 2003, Occupied Voices, Stories of Everyday Life from the Second Intifada, and the second one, Violence, Nonviolence, and the Passion. Palestinian National Movement, which came out in 2011. But maybe let's start with the earlier one. Um, so what made you want to write Occupied Voices? Um, and what is the book about? Yeah, so um, I studied at Beers 8 University um, from January to about May or June 2000. Um, this was sort of between uh, my master's program and, and starting a, a PhD. And um, I had been studying the, the Middle East and North Africa for several years before that and studying Arabic, um, but it was my first time in Palestine. And I was, you know, absolutely gripped by it, as I think um, most people are who set foot, even for a matter of hours in Palestine. And it was a really uh, tremendous experience. So I, I took classes at Birzeit and I uh, volunteered for a Palestinian human rights organization and uh, then moved on and was studying Arabic in in Cairo um, in the CASA program at, at AUC for the academic year of uh, the 2000-2001 academic year. So I was there when the second intifada began. And because I had just, um, you know, developed this, you know, personal and, and political and emotional connection to the area, I was, I was really beside myself when, um, when violence began and it was, um, uh, it, so um, overwhelming for me at that time in the fall of 2000, when the second intifada began, which is really, it's, I mean, this, this, this current moment is taking me back to those days of the, of the, the, the overwhelming, of the shock, the day to day of, of, of catching how the violence had developed from day to day, the, the casualty counts day to day and not knowing where this would lead or when this, where it would go, but, but a sense that there was a, a momentous turning point underway. So I was always, you know, I, I always say that my year in Cairo was wasted on me because I didn't, and I really connected to Egypt because my entire mind and heart was in Palestine the whole time. And I was trying to get as much information as I could. And of course, the um, American media coverage was um, was so bad at the time. There was this current, re, you know, refrain again and again, of Arafat has put Israel under siege and the backdrop, backdrop of the Camp David um, summit of 2000 of, of Israel offering this unprecedented generous offer that that uh, Palestinians rejected to show their true face of turning to violence. I mean, all these types of tropes that we are so familiar with. And I, I, I felt like I couldn't get a sense of what it was like for real people living this moment. Um, and I thought there sort of was no better way to find out than to have the chance to go and, and ask people. So I waited for the winter break between the fall and, and spring semesters in my study in Egypt and basically took the first bus I could go back and went back to um, to the West Bank and to, to East Jerusalem. And I uh, had a visit in Gaza at that time as well and basically talked to anybody I could. I had a very like, cheap tape recorder and anybody I could, I just basically asked, what has this time been like for you? And I got reflections on those first uh three months of, of the second intifada, the fall of 2000, but also larger reflections about what it means to be Palestinian, about what um, people's frustrations were with the Oslo process and, and how it did not deliver on basic aspirations for freedom, for dignity, for self-determination. Um, but it was my first experience seeing, trying to understand major political events and structures and processes through ordinary people just talking about their lives. Um, so I did the interviews I could and uh, then came back to Egypt. It was a slow process of transcribing and translating 
all of those uh, interviews. Um, it became something of a collective project of all of my classmates um, in, in, in Egypt, also maybe taking a, a tape or taking half a tape and various people helped, helped get that from audio onto uh, print. And it was a few years later that I was able to sort of shape it into a book of interviews. So the, the book in the end um, is a, a series of a couple dozen people um, of different walks of life to try to represent some of the diversity, both of the Palestinian people and the diversity of, of issues and topics that were really prominent in the news at that time. Uh, I was able to connect with a wonderful Finnish photographer named Laura Junka, who um, ended up taking uh, photographs of each of these individuals. Um, we went back in, um, I think it was maybe January 2003 to try to revisit everyone again to get little bits of updates because by the time I was able to transform those interviews into a book, some time had passed and, and the Palestinian struggle was in a different, a different place. So the, the conclusion is a bit of an update of where people were two, two years later. And, and the book is called Occupied Voices, Stories of Everyday Life from the Second Intifada that just tries to connect on a human, a human level and have a human window into the Palestinian experience. Do you think that 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 book would have been meaningfully different if you had written it in 1993 or if you had written in 2013? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's I mean, there are there are parts of people's stories that are um, timeless, I think, in the Palestinian experience. Um, stories about what uh, what Palestine means, what being a refugee means, what 1948 means about the basic um, the basic hopes, the experience of occupation. Um, so some of those, those comments on, on basic structural historical elements that, that have shaped Palestinian experiences for decades and decades remain. Um, but each era has its own mood and has its own hopes and has its own disappointments. So, I, uh, I think this 2000, this fall 2000 moment was very much um, one of, of grappling with the way the, the Oslo peace process had failed. And um, had those interviews been done at the outset of the Oslo process, I imagine they would have been much more reflecting on the first intifada and frankly, more hope that the, that the negotiations, negotiations process would, would deliver statehood. Because political opinion polls from that moment showed while, while many people, of course, had critiques of the Oslo process and perhaps the, the, the wisest uh, 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 of, of all could see its fatal flaws and the ways that it would um, be a kind of uh, repackaging of the occupation and not deliver true self-determination self -determination and sovereignty. Opinion polls showed that a lot of people had had hope and it could be that hope was a mix of of the sheer exhaustion of the toll the first intifada had taken, um, all people need hope, you know, to yeah. hope that it could. Well, there might be some some you know skeptical, some doubts, some hope that it could it could uh, the best outcome could be achieved. So I, I imagine that 1993 would 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 capture that that um, yeah that yeah. And by 2013, I don't think the peace process was even a frame of reference anymore. Um, I mean, it is as I think a, a frame of reference of of uh, of the disappointments of, of 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 a political process and negotiations, but um, you know was had gone closer to the dustbin of history by by yeah. that. Thing. Okay, so I have I have questions about Oslo that I, I would love to talk about, but before that, yeah. I just want to ask you a really basic question. I don't think I've ever asked somebody. Yeah. It does. What is a peace process? <laughs> what is a peace process? Well, I um, mean, like, and that, like, you know, this idea that, like, you know, that there is a peace process happening. What does that actually mean in Palestine? When did the peace process, as we know it, like capital P, capital P, like, when did the peace process start, and when did it end in Palestine? Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's a terrific questions, and I would have to, you know, go back to my 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 notes and my books to be sure. able to with 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 more confidence. But in some ways, I think the, the the term peace process in the in the in the Middle East context, you know, really begins in the in the nineteen seventies. 
and after the 1973 war and the U.S. Kissinger shuttle dis- diplomacy in trying to get Israel and Arab states to negotiate um, some uh, some sort of end to the Arab-Israeli conflict, including Israeli withdrawals from from chiefly Egyptian territory, and then, and then the, the process that that leads to the Egyptian Israeli uh, peace treaty and Israeli withdrawal of the Sinai and Egyptian recognition of Israel. So that's, the, the, I think, the first sort of lexicon of the peace process. Of course, the heart of the heart of the Arab-Israeli conflict is the conflict over Palestine. And the peace process in the Palestinian context, um, I think it takes a few forms. So one is, of course, that the, the first intifada and the, um, the way that insisted upon putting the Palestine question on the map of the an international community that probably wanted to ignore it and was ignoring it, the way that it, it showed Israel the unsustainability of the occupation and needing to find some resolution that entailed withdrawal um, from the occupied territories and some accommodation with Palestinian nationalism, you know, uh, created a, a context that could ripen um, a base for, for Israel and the PLO um, as the recognized sole legitimate representative of the Palestinian people to begin talking. The, Israel had not recognized it, would, it was illegal for Israelis to speak to the PLO. The PLO in that time in, in Tunis, for also his various own internal political reason, reasons, wanted um, uh, a solution to, um, to, to something to better the, the Palestinian situation. Um, in, it was in that context that, that the Israeli government began to legalize contacts with the PLO um, emissaries of the Israeli government and the PLO met secretly to begin talking. At the same time, there's a, sort of another, another a branch of the peace, of peace negotiations that begins 1991 with the Madrid conference in the wake of the, the, uh, the beginning of the first Iraq war to bring um, Israel, Arab heads of state, and some representative for the Palestinians as part of the Jordanian delegation to Madrid to try to talk about some and negotiate some some resolution um, on the you know and in, in the context of the first intifada. So while there were these public negotiations that were launched in Madrid, and then there were um, Palestinian and Israeli representatives that continued to talk at various rounds in Washington, called the Washington rounds, trying to think about some some kind of separation and some kind of resolution. You had Israeli and PLO leaders secretly speaking, um, ultimately in, in Oslo, in Oslo, Norway. Um, so all of this is, I think, ways of whether secretly or in public, um, Israeli and Palestinian leaders and representatives coming together to talk about how to, to disentangle and end the occupation or um, or create some some resolution to a situation the Intifada had shown was untenable. Um, the Oslo process then launches in September 1993, the sort of revealing of um, that there had been these secret talks. And the in the Oslo process, I think that is interesting in terms of thinking about what peace process means is unlike in other areas and other conflicts of the world where there are talks that lead to a peace treaty, that lead to a settlement, that lead to a final resolution, um, you know, perhaps in, in Northern Ireland, for example, or, or the talks in South Africa that led to an agreement, the Oslo process was simply an agreement to start talking start talking publicly. It was a framework for phased negotiations. Now, many looked at that and hoped that it would lead to a final settlement, but all the parties basically agreed to was to talk. And there's this very famous exchange of letters um, between Israeli Prime Minister Isaac Rabin and, and Yasser Arafat as chairman of the PLO of, of the sort of exchange of goodwill that was a part of that September 13th, you know, White House ceremony that launched the Oslo Accords. And if you look at the Israeli letter, all Rabin said in his letter, which is about two or three sentences long, is that Israel recognizes the PLO and will start talking to the PLO. There's nothing about Palestinian statehood. There's nothing about any concessions besides recognizing the PLO and talking to the PLO. In exchange, Arafat recognized Israel you know, renounced violence and listed a whole host of, of, of concessions, as is what Oslo ultimately represented for, for Palestinians. But all it was was a phased framework with the idea that Israel would begin to withdraw from some Palestinian population centers 
in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, that the Palestinians would create some interim self-governing apparatus to govern Palestinians in the areas from which Israel withdrew, would withdraw. That, and after um, five years, or by 1999, the parties would um, reach a final settlement on the major outstanding issues, including settlements, refugees, borders, water, and statehood. And of course, that final settlement never never came. So Oslo was just a, a process to talk. Yeah. And it meant was then cover to allow all sorts of other things to happen, um, like like increasing settlement building the entire yeah. time. So if we can begin to tie that to some of the stuff that your second book begins to unpack, um, violence, nonviolence, and the Palestinian national movement, um, walk us through, if you will, the response to that failure um, and um, what happened in the prevailing years. Yeah, so if I could say a little bit about how I came to write Violence and Animals in, in, the, in the first place. So I wrote this book, Occupied Voices, and I did a series of book talks um, after it was published in 2003. And what I found, um, you know, some, some sympathetic audiences, a lot of hostile audiences, but a question that I got again and again and again was something of the sort of in, in these in these book talks across the United States. Um, of, yes, we know Palestinians suffer and occupation is terrible. But what about the violence? What about the violence? These American audience couldn't get past what they saw as an association between Palestinians and the use of, of violence and would ask things like, where is the Palestinian Gandhi? And, and these types of questions. And, and I found again and again that I, I, I needed to ex explain um, basically a question of why are Palestinians using violence all the time? And that became the kind of motivation for what ended up being my dissertation when I did my PhD in political science. And then that, that dissertation was revised to become the book Violence and Nonviolence. And the basic premise is like, these are, these are bad and stupid questions. Palestinians have used unarmed forms of resistance as well as armed force forms of resistance for over a hundred years. These have varied over time and space and and and, and nonviolent protest is, is complicated and it's always violent protest. But I wanted to, to write a sort of a political history of the use of, of a violent and nonviolent protest over time, as well as um, provide some explanation that could be um, one of several answers to this question of, of why essentially does any self-determination movement or any national movement or any kind of social movement use violent or nonviolent strategies um, when they do and how they do, how that varies across the life of a movement and and what explains different movements, tactics at different at different times. And ultimately, I think I came to the idea that there are many, you know, uh, these strategic and tactical choices are complicated and multidimensional. There's not a single answer uh, certainly what Israel does has an enormous effect on what and what Palestinians own protest strategies are and what those protest strategies can be given the sort of structural controls of the occupation um, and the, the basic, you know, a, a huge as, as, asymmetry of the very nature of the conflict. Um, there could be, you know, ideological and uh, reasons for, for one type of struggle or another. But I ultimately um, wanted to highlight one factor which I thought was not getting enough uh, tension at that time, which is the internal politics and the internal organizational dimensions of nonviolent protest. And the argument that I came upon is that that movements um, require a basic degree of internal cohesion and coordination to launch and sustain nonviolent protest. Nonviolent protest requires mass numbers, which uh, a sort of be, uh, sweeping organizational unity can help recruit and help sustain. It requires constraint um, so that doesn't take a small group of people who might want to take up arms and can transform a nonviolent protest to a violent one. So nonviolent protest, um, it's hard to, to launch nonviolent protests without organizational um, cohesion in the form of leadership, uh, a unified public opinion to some degree and in a certain organizational framework. Whereas that the more any movement is internally fragmented, um, lacking one leadership with internal factionalism and divisions, 
of various kinds and weak institutional structures, um, the more likely any movement is to use armed struggle because uh, factions can use violence even against uh, uh, an external enemy as a way of of, um, uh, competing with each other for public support um, because any uh, attempts at sort of constraining violence can easily be um, overturned by very small numbers. Um, and uh, because that, those kinds of divisions make it difficult to recruit um, and sustain mass participation among among large, large numbers of the population as is required for, for, for really viable, uh, sustained nonviolent protests. So that's the basic argument. And the book looks at that pattern, the relationship between cohesion and nonviolence and between fragmentation and violence over the um, you know, the entire 20th century uh, into the 21st century history of the Palestinian national movement, beginning from the, the 19 teens and 20s um, into the Second Intifada. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will not ask you to predict the future. Um, yeah. I want to understand, looking at other historical examples, whether it's I mean, Ireland or South Africa, what is the option set of what can happen I mean, looking at where we are right now, I mean, if we look at sort of these different situations, um, I mean, what is the path? What are the different doors? Like, okay, well, one option is we go down this path and this is what it looks like. And one option is this happens or this other thing happens. And without having to ask you to predict where we're going, what is the historical precedent for any sort of peace and prosperity in the medium to long future, long-term future? I mean, given, given the current moment, 2023, where Palestine is now. Correct. Oh goodness. This is, um, this is hard. It's, I mean, the situation is, is bleak. But at the same time, um, unpredictable in a way that perhaps, uh, perhaps a kind of the tidal wave shift needed from uh, the bleakness of the status quo could be, could be something in in the future. So, I mean, if you'd asked me this question on October sixth, you know, it would seem to be the status quo is. Uh, Gaza as an open air prison, um, blockade and and unlivable conditions and no change in sight. Um, uh, an increasingly right wing Israeli political scene and in government um, bent on um, annexing as much of the West Bank as they could. So ongoing military and settler violence um, in in the West Bank with uh, Israel having. You know, safely contained uh, Gaza, that they're not taking as much of the West Bank and and, and East Jerusalem as they possibly can. Um, very weak and inept political Palestinian Authority leadership. Um, you know, uh, increasingly authoritarian Hamas in in the Gaza Strip. So no no inspiring, legitimate, capable Palestinian leadership. Um, and and Israel with all the cards in its its hands, uh, an America that couldn't care less and wants to focus on China, and and um, thinking that you can get Israel to sign agreements with um, Arab heads of state who are also happy to wash their hands and ignore the Palestinian problem uh, entirely. Palestinian problem that is, um, and and everything's okay. And Palestine Palestinian struggle is dead, contained, tired, and um, ignorable. That's what I would say is the status quo on October sixth. I mean, the, the violence since October 7th has been absolutely unspeakable, defies words, the absolute horror that is happening in, in Gaza and the ongoing violence in the West Bank while, while people focuses on Gaza. Um, so it's criminal to talk about any sort of silver linings. There are no silver linings of something that is, that is genocidal. But people are talking about Palestine now. The, the idea that you can ignore Palestine, that Israel can find peace agreements with Sudan and the UAE and the Palestine problem, you know, again, problem in quotes, Palestine will disappear, that there 
um, that that is sustainable and that can bring security to Israel um, is, is is shattered. There is there is no um, there will be violence and instability and suffering in the Middle East as long as Palestinians do not have some sort of ability to live with dignity and, and freedom in their homeland. Um, maybe this this opens up some new horizons, at the very least international attention, the mobilizations on the streets um, across the world are extremely heartening. Um, in, in maybe we can see new kinds of international solidarity mobilization, um, but but the um, uh, 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 that status quo that had existed for many, many years, um, this is a reminder that that's, that's untenable. Um, yeah, it's again, what's what's happening now. I, I, I can't speak about that as silver linings. So this, this situation is way, 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 way too dark. And the, the, the suffering and death is immense. But we're in a new a new. Um, I think a, a slightly new uh, framework for Palestine now. I hope I hope. Yeah. OK, here's another question for you. Sure. Let's say you're speaking to somebody who is historically, uh, let's say, pro-Israeli, for lack of a better term, um, and these th this is a compassionate person. Okay, it's non-genocidal, um, you know, compassionate person, um, and you're having a conversation with this person, um, and they say to you. My dream is a two-state solution. Two two states side by side. Um, what would your response be to this person for why that s solution could or could not work? And if it can't work, when did it when did the dream of a two-state solution die? Oh, such good questions, Mikey. Um so I, I'd say the one person is, I mean, one answer is um, two-state solution, great. Is you okay with John and have it in a second? Withdraw the 67 borders. Let Palestinians have have, have genuine sovereignty in, in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, some kind of safe corridor that connects the West Bank and the Gaza Strip in the capital in East Jerusalem. This had, this had robust support as public opinion polls showed among uh, among Palestinians and also among among you know large a large number of Israelis um at the outset of this thing called the Oslo peace process if Israel wanted a two state solution it could have one in a second it's a question of Israeli withdrawals um and if there is not a two state solution it's because Israel does not want to give up on that land one to might doesn't want to give give up on land that many in Israel want and claim as should be part of the state of Israel, or and <laughs> to um, the question of Israel's genuine readiness to live side by side a truly viable Palestinian state where Palestinians rule themselves and are not under an Israeli boot, um, a, 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 a true, a true. Uh, genuine acceptance of of Palestinians equal rights as human beings to to rule themselves and and not be ruled by Israel. So if Israel could withdraw from the land and accept you know Palestinians basic humanity and, and rights as 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 individuals and as a national political entity, there could be a two state solution tomorrow. There isn't because of non acceptance of of those those two items. And in the absence of it, ongoing settlement construction in in the West Bank, um, the you know, fragmentation of Palestinian communities in the West Bank into dozens and dozens of discontiguous islands where people can't travel from one place to another, the refusal to allow um, a, a Gaza that that can have. Uh, live blockade free and allow people and goods to go in and out and have some sort of viability control its airspace it's 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 out by by sea by land um control borders have true have true statehood 
Israel's continued unwillingness to allow that shows its its unreadiness for a two-state solution. In the absence of that, I don't know how a two-state solution is possible. At the same time, I'm not sure what other solutions exist. So I'm very sympathetic to the idea of a, of a single, of a one-state solution, of a single binational state, of a single apartheid-free state in which in which all people can live with with rights and dignity, as many in the political science community now like to say, um, there is there is a one state reality, but not a one state solution. There is one state between the river and the sea. It's the state of Israel, um, but it's not a solution. It's a situation of, of apartheid, of, of the intent to, to 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 create and sustain racial domination of one group over another. Um, but calling for a, a one state reality also is calling um, for for Israel to, and Israelis, to give up on the dream of a Jewish state, which Israel has. An exclusively Jewish state. An exclusively Jewish state, yeah. Um, and maybe maybe with exchange and discourse and the untenability of the, of the status quo, um, Israelis can, can come to um, embrace this as what is best for all peoples between the river and the sea. But but given what I see in the Israeli public right now, um, it, it seems like Israel is quite, quite far from it. It's hard yeah, to imagine. So, but who knows? Who knows? I mean, history is long. Yeah. But if we take a look at other, the, if we use history as a guide, what would have to happen? I mean, like, I, I was playing this this uh, thought experiment in my head a couple of days ago, uh, and I was like, if I could control everyone's actions, and I, and I just tried to be this like benevolent dictator, and say, okay, listen, I'm going to actually do what is best for everyone. Okay, I I, I know, all right, yeah. and I'm I'm just going to make the decisions for everyone, and it's going to be uncomfortable. Everyone's going to have to give up something, but I'm going to just make all these decisions with justice, like capital J justice in mind, what would I do, right? But I know a lot less than you do. So I'm going to ask you that question. But I think if that were, were the case, <laughs> really, I think a, a single state, a single state that in which all Jews and and Palestinians, regardless, Arabs of, of Palestinians, Muslim, Christian, Israeli Jews, from various parts of the world, whoever is living in this territory now, with um with equal rights period and be able to move from place to place um accommodation for for right of return um you know and an interesting public opinion poll show for for palestinian refugees scattered across the world the right of return is non-negotiable it is a right that was recognized by the united nations it is um people should have the right to go back to their polls um israel has has always said well that it visions you know, millions of Palestinians marching to the borders and, and Israel loses its its demographic Jewish majority and ceases to be a Jewish state. Well, in this one state reality, this exclusive Jewish national character of the state is a non-issue. Um, and uh, yeah, and we'll see if, if, you know, many Palestinian refugees might choose not actually to come back and relocate to their, to their, their old homes and villages, but a right that is recognized for them to make that choice. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, that I think that that would be the heaven and um, this exclusive nationalism that states have to have some demographic majority that they have to rule in the name of one people narrowly defined in ethnic or religious terms. This is all the making of exclusivity, of exploitation, of denial, of, of hierarchy, of injustice. Um, but a basis in, of, of equal rights and equal freedoms to be able to live with dignity, to be able to to live in or at least visit and touch the land of 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 of, of a territory where your family has a history and your people has a history, um, you know, it, th th that would create security and safety. Um, uh, but people would need to use violence or suppress or oppress their their fellow citizen. They could live as neighbors. So yeah, it might be a bit of a, a pipe dream, but 
But the current reality is a recipe for violence and suffering and death. That is that is clear as day. The current yeah. reality is 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 a rest will only bring violence, insecurity, suffering, death. Um, that is all human made and also completely unnecessary. So much destruction and death and total vain. People want just want to live and and have futures for their children. Breathe. There's no reason why it or shouldn't happen. Yeah. So you work on a college campus in the U.S. Um, students who are not pro-Palestinian or do not have free Palestine t-shirts or buttons or think about uh, themselves as being part of the solidarity movement, but did care about things like Black Life, Lives Matter and didn't, did care about other things. What do you think they most misunderstand about what's happening in Palestine that would have them not be able to come to the conclusion that, yes, I also want the same one state solution. I also dream of a similar thing. So I can say based on my experience, and I love Northwestern University students. <laughs> They're fantastic. There is um, an awful lot of lack of the most basic knowledge. on the um, I have had students ask me um, questions don't believe. I mean, one is I have had many students who come to me and they think that a uh, Palestine is a state. This is a generation that's grown up hearing the word Palestine in a way that my generation didn't. Israel, Palestine, Israel, Palestine, Israel slash Palestine in Israel, Palestine. There's a change of discourse, which in many ways you know, dignifies and recognizes um, Palestine as, as, a, as a concept and as a word that prior generations couldn't even say. That's an achievement. But one, I think, unintended negative consequence of that is, is young people who've grown up hearing P Palestine and Israel Palestine on the news, but don't have basic knowledge. I had many students who think that Palestine is a state, that this is a conflict between the state of Israel and the state of Palestine that are struggling over territory, like India and Pakistan are struggling over Kashmir. Or like Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we need to go back to the basics um, so there's there's a lot of of, of of lack of the most basic knowledge about what the context, what it is about, Israel and Palestine. I have a student ask me questions like, how did the Palestinians get there? Thinking that somehow there was a state of Israel and Palestinians were like flown in to give Israel, Israel problems. I had a student many years ago say, oh, I thought that Hamas was a person. Um, it's like they're hearing Hamas in the news. So, and and yeah. I don't like, they blame these students because as long as they, these young people, as long as they... Uh, have been alive, they've been hearing this in the news, but that, that, that flashes the headlines of what's happening at the moment and have not had the chance to sit down and get the history lesson that puts all of this in context from the 19th century rise of the Zionist movement through the British mandate, all the history of wars and maps and border changes and occupation that lead to the current reality. So I think that there are many students who might, that would, if they knew more, would see that the, the call of the Palestinian struggle is completely consistent with their values on other conflicts and issues or, or struggles they understand more, like the struggle for racial justice and equality in the United States, which most Americans will, you know, a lot of Americans get in a way that this is a foreign, a foreign conflict they don't really understand. So uh, we just given more information. That's why um, uh, one of the things that's most important to me is simply... Um, that uh, to more information. So one thing I find again and again is that I don't, I don't think that the issue is pers for the young people I come into contact with is the issue isn't necessarily persuading them. Some people who come in with certain assumptions or certain allegiances might need more convincing and persuading and analysis. A lot of people simply need the facts and the facts speak. And the more that people learn simply the, the facts and the history um, they come to their conclusion. They're all, the conclusion's almost on their own of a certain solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. So when I teach, it's often quite factual. Let's just go through the history step by step by step. And students who began without much necessarily um, a sense of solidarity or support of Palestinian rights, you know, you give them three lectures on the history and some basic readings and they leave with that solidarity because the facts themselves speak. And almost the strongest... Um, uh, you know, um, 
campaign against Palestinian rights and struggles in the U.S. is to deny those basic rights. That's 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 what will weaken the Palis- uh, a movement in Palestinian solidarity is to keep people from understanding the basics. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about the history of this like activism and grassroots activism. Um, maybe the easiest question is like, let's just start in the nineties. How has grassroots activism um, in the Palestine solidarity movement, both in Palestine and globally, changed over the last thirty years? You know, internationally or in the U.S. Yeah, both internationally uh, and the U.S., but also the sort of local um, nonviolent um, nonviolent movements in Palestine. So maybe let's take it uh, there at separate. So let's talk about internationally in the U.S. first. Yeah, I mean, this is something I haven't looked at. Um, much myself, but, you know, I was at the, I guess it was the 2003 sort of really large rally in Washington um, in, in solidarity with, with Palestine. And to see where we are 20 years later, it is a much larger, more, um, you know, massive and global movement. And that is really, really heartening. And exactly as you were saying, I, I, you know, I think for many young Americans, once they've got a basic understanding of, of of what the situation is about, they are making the connections with Black Lives Matter and seeing this through a racial justice lens and seeing basic issues of of oppression, suppression, apartheid, police brutality, you know, concepts and issues um, that that make sense to them and can see how they apply to Palestine and have an understanding of 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 Palestine that a prior generation that saw this in terms of peace process and conflict and suicide bombings or an Arab Israeli conflict um that that's a different lens so there's a different um set of, a different set of a, a vocabulary with which to describe Palestine um that allows for synergies and mutual understandings um you know that there I can see young people now who use the term settler colonialism and understand the settler colonial aspect in a way, which of course has been present for a hundred years, but has risen in a kind of discourse um, with with a, with a, a, an intensity and a strength that that offers people a lens of understanding the terminology of apartheid, which we now know has been so um, painstakingly, meticulously documented by human rights organization out one after another, provides another lens. Um, these are terms that are, are the moral legitimacy of struggles against apartheid settler colonialism, cleansing genocide is very difficult um, to dispute. So it gives a, a new generation a different, um, almost a different arsenal of, of, of the words and concepts that are rallying people in the streets. So there might be some question of, I mean, street demonstrations are always a possibility, but there's a conceptual shift um, that that helps helps understanding of Palestine get through all the noise that can be created to create obstacles and to um, to block that solidarity that I'm incredibly hardened by 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 seeing people um, embrace and understand. For people who don't know the history, can I just ask? And maybe you maybe you're like Mikey. This is not what I know, so <laughs> stop asking me these questions. No. But you know. I agree with you. People are starting to become more and more comfortable with using terms like settler colonialism and apartheid and um, understanding that this is an indigenous population versus, uh, you know, a a colonial population, uh, a colonizing group. And then somebody asked me a really, really basic question. And I was like, I don't know if I know the answer to this question, which is, okay, if this is apartheid, and I associate with apartheid with South Africa. How did South African apartheid end? And how might we use that as a playbook for how Palestinian, how the apartheid in Palestine, in Palestine might end? Mm-hmm. Great. So, I mean, so one is, I mean, you know, there's this UN recognition and intentional recognition of, of the crimes of apartheid that give it a legal definition and in international law separate from the, the South African experience. So it does have a... Uh, um, you know, these various legal elements, conceptual elements, such that 
you know, so people say, oh, well, this is all the ways that Israel is not like South Africa or Palestine is not like South Africa can be beside the point because apartheid is, is now something that extracted from the South African context. But for the South African movement, so it was also a struggle over many, many decades. Um, it was also a struggle that, like the Palestinian struggle, involved both um, unarmed, uh, nonviolent forms of mobilization and armed struggle. Um, like the Palestinian struggle um, involved a uh, political leadership that was exiled um, um, and imprisoned. Um, in in some ways, I think the and this gets to sort of my argument in violence and, and nonviolence that in some ways I think that one strength of the um, of the anti-apartheid struggle was the kind of overwhelming um, leadership of the ANC, that there were smaller pal- smaller um, South African uh, groups that were, um, but the ANC was overwhelmingly the, the most powerful single, le- you know, le- legitimate leadership that most uh, South African anti-apartheid um, identifiers looked to. And that, that power of, of a leadership that was legitimate, that was clear-sighted, that, uh, uh, Offered offered a strategy that um, in order that that kind of the um, disappointingness of some of the Palestinian political factions and, and leaders had not perhaps offered that kind of vision. Um, there was also some would say um, a different, a more uh, a different philosophy of or uh, different approaches of armed struggle at the ANC. Um, for the most part, was I mean, did use um, struggles. So some people now look and say, "Oh, the anti-apartheid struggle was nonviolent." No, there was absolutely uh, an embrace of, of armed struggle, but there was um, it, it was on a much smaller scale and more deliberately targeting sort of military targets rather than targeting civilians. That was um, uh, part of the the anti-apartheid armed struggle approach, as, as I understand it. But there was also, I mean, it, in what kind of led to um, to force the apartheid South African government to negotiate was also the power of disruption of, of, of street action, similar to the, the first intifada of, of making the, the, the Bantustans and the, and, the, and, the, and the black South African areas ungovernable to show that this was uh, an, an unsustainable status quo. Um, as well as strikes, the very uh, powerful part of, of the South African labor movement um, that the country depended upon black labor and when black labor uh, refused to accommodate by strikes, and work stoppages and, and other um, elements to bring the economy to a halt, as well as a very powerful international movement of, of boycott, divestment and sanction. Um, that this combined pressure from outside, inside, on the streets, uh, on the pocketbooks of of those who benefited from the apartheid um, status quo. And so I think there were various interesting sort of um, uh, kinds of pressures that came to, came to bear. And one was a kind of a splitting between um, the economic elites of the white South African um, elites and, and the governmental elites. That the government, part, part, some of hardliners in the government might have wanted to hold on to apartheid forever. But you had capitalists and economic elites who said, this is really, really, this is terrible for business. We want to make money and we cannot yeah, we, because of, of the sheer disruption. And apartheid has to go because economically uh, we can't sustain it. And this is more important to us. So I think that that kind of thinking about how um, protest and opposition and dissent can create defections, can create splits in a in the regime, whatever is the power structure that maintains an oppressive status quo, if pressure from below, if pressure from the outside, different types of pressure create splits, create defections that convince some who are necessary to maintain an oppressive status quo, convince some of them to say, this is no longer in our interest. It's no longer in my interest. I'd rather make some concessions and some accommodations and give up on my position of superiority um, because my interests are no longer served in the system. That is what it takes. And this is similar to the kinds of the, the uprisings we saw throughout the Arab world in 2011 of grassroots uprisings and, and protests and revolutions. You need to create some cracks in the ruling structure um, in order to overturn it. 
And I think that's the same sort of logic for, for Palestinian freedom and where that pressure comes from. All the more powerful if it is pressure coming from every possible angle, given the, the sheer, um, the, sh- the enormity of the task of, 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 of convincing Israel to make, um, to do things it doesn't want to do. Um, it needs pressure from all sides um, to convince Israelis um, that change what Israelis need to do for their own interests if they are not persuaded by the arguments of humanity and, 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 and decency in this case. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's an interesting case to make as you were speaking that in some ways, like it's not a strike, but I mean, the Israeli economy is cratering right now, um, for, for many reasons. One of them is because of the enormous labor shortages, because of how much they depend on Palestinian labor. Um, and I was reading a report, uh, a Bloomberg report about, you know, like three or four, um, at three of the rating agencies, uh, downgraded, um, downgraded the Israeli economy and the, the, their credit scores. So maybe there's a case to be made. Um, um, okay. Before we wrap up, I want to wrap up, but, um, I also just want to ask you, how are you? I didn't even ask you. Okay, thank you. It's funny because I was just at the Middle East Studies Association conference this past weekend, and it's usually a time where you see all these old friends from your entire life in the Middle East Studies community. And um, every single conversation I had was like, "Hey, Palestine, how are things on your campus? How are how are you Palestine, Palestine, Palestine?" And we would often talk for like an hour before we asked precisely this question. Oh, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. Thank you, El. It's, um, and I appreciate you asking about sort of the situation on American campuses because it has been, it's been quite overwhelming. I think many of us are dealing with statements from university administrations that are, um, you know, very one-sided to, 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 to be diplomatic about how to critique them, um, about especially, uh, Palestinian Arab Muslim students, students who identify and support Palestine in one way or another, Jewish students who are supportive of Palestinian rights, feeling unseen, unheard, unrepresented by university administrations, feeling about something that we've been talking a lot on our campus about the disparities of care, that there are various institutional structures um, and and other uh, more unison resources institutionally, materially, uh, frankly, for Jewish students on campus who identify with Israel and support Israel and many fewer institutional material resources for, for um, the rest of the student body who is critical of Israel at this moment. Um, we've been dealing with these types of issues of student support and um, and concern about our administration, as well as trying to do as much Palestine-related programming as possible because, um, because the sheer uh, hunger to understand and the need to understand um, is so is so great. So um, so I'm doing okay, but that but so much of the moment. Um, and on the one hand, I'm I'm trying to follow the news. I have friends in Gaza that I'm trying to you know write as often as I can to say, "Are you alive?" And and um, it, and my heart is with with them. Um, but but professionally, I find myself in a in a position where I have professional obligations on my campus to try to be a part of as positive a response um, as possible uh, in, the, in the realm of both student support and, and programming um, and, and staking out some space at, at the university where, um, where solidarity with Palestine and programming um, and educational missions to shed light on on, on, on Palestinians' reality is, you know, how can, what can we do? And there's, there's no end. You can't do enough. You totally yeah. can't. The end is, it's, the need is endless. And so that's difficult because everything we do feels inadequate and everything we do feels too little, too late um, because of the sheer enormity of, of, of the problem. Do you, um, is there a playbook for convincing people who are not, uninformed, but rather misinformed? I guess maybe it depends on what people are misinformed about. Um, again, my approach of this is, has always been, or my, my fallback is, is history. 
my fallback is let's, um, information might be easy if you start the book in chapter 25 and things look a certain way. But if you go back and see how they came to be that way, um, which I think is part of the, 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 the problem now of these kinds of conversations about after October 7th, as if that's when the history began, that I have found that the more I simply go back the beginning of the beginnings of the story and try to go through step by step, step by step, people understand how it is that we got to this point and see the deep injustices and deep asymmetries that this, that this point embodies makes, um, makes what people do and why they do it more, more intelligible. So, um, my, my intuition is with a playbook is always go back one step or several steps further in time than you probably think is necessary. And that's what makes, makes the understanding come alive. Um, so when I, when I teach on this topic and often even in conversations, I, I sort of begin with the idea of the rise of the Zionist movement and creation of wanting to create a, a Jewish state in a land that was, had less than a 5% Jewish minority um, and how that required to transform a, a land with a huge indigenous Palestinian Arab majority into a Jewish state that led to uh, dispossession and, um, and displacement. And everything is followed from that, um, from that premise. So I, that, that, yeah. that, that's my intuition, history. Okay. Because we're talking about history and, and just to wrap up, um, I'm going to role play. I'm going to be a student who comes up to you and says, Professor Perlman, I want to learn. I saw, I saw you speak at a teach-in. Um, what are the first five books I should go pick up? Oh, goodness. Um, so I can, I can it dep- again, again, it depends on where, where you're, you're coming from. So, um, I mean, where there are, there are lots of good books. I can say um, that the book that I actually use in class is uh, The Lemon Tree by Sandy Toll. Now, this is not, it is problematic in, ver- in various ways. It is, it is not the best history of Palestine at all. Um, but especially, but it reaches students who have um, allegiances with with Israel and 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 um, identify with Israel. It's something I can teach to an, a classroom of eighty students who are people coming in with all sorts of backgrounds, and a student who has been who was raised to support Israel from as far as I can remember, and the student who knows nothing, and the student who has sort of vague solidarities with Palestine, but doesn't really understand much, that this is, um, this is a book that, that is effective for your average ordinary, you know, your average ordinary American and does not alienate people from one side or the other. So it is, it is what I have found to be the most effective in a classroom um, with, with very, very diverse ways in which I don't want to, I don't want to alienate. Um, I, I want everyone to have enough goodwill to give it a shot to opening to some history. So it is a, it is a, a very moderate, light introduction to the Nakba. Um, but it is a book that would be quote unquote, even handed both sides. That's problematic for those of us who actually really know Palestine. We, we, we know the limitations, but um, looking at a reality of, of, of um, your average American population, I've, I've found that one to be effective. So that's where I have, I have students start. And then they can graduate to things that are more, are more sophisticated and get into some of the concepts like settler colonialism, apartheid, and the cleansing and genocide that yeah. I, I find my students aren't ready for on day. Most, most of my students aren't ready for for day one. And if I begin with that on day one, they, um, I could lose them. So I've got to try to meet students where they, where they are. I think there's so much wisdom in that. Um, and I'm so happy you said that. I was listening to Tana Hesse Coates speak. Mm-hmm. There's been a couple of clips of his his go, that have gone viral. Um, he was speaking at Palfest. Um but I he did something in his speech that I thought was something I had never heard anyone do and I had I certainly had never thought of. He was talking about the situation in Palestine and he said these were people he was talking about the Palestinians as 
um, living in a situation that he completely recognized because it was reminded him of the country he grew up. He said, there's a country that I recognize just in a, in a different time. There's the same country, but in a different time. And he said something, he said, these Palestinians can't even vote. Which for me, I thought, who cares about voting? I mean, they can't breathe. They can't drink water. They have the boat boot of Palestinian, of IDF soldiers on their neck. They're getting shot. Who cares about voting? But I realized that it's a language that falls on the listener's ears, the American listener's ears, as in, oh, wait, that's something that is in, unjust. And I was talking to my brother about this, and I was saying, they're so used to lemonade, they cannot handle lemons. So that, like, you need to add some sugar for them to even taste the lemon, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. You kind of, it's meat. I think about that when I, in, the, in the classroom of, I want to take each student by the hand and see where they are, you know, at one or in two and push them a little bit more. If I push them from one to three, from four to five, um, some students might be ready for 15, um, but for for some students, um, and, and especially students who have, who have grown up with a certain narrative of about Israel, with a certain narrative about what it means to be Jewish, with a certain you know narrative um, that this sort of goes deep, not only just ideas they have, but it is their very sense of identity. I have many of these students at Northwestern who are in my class that um, it is a struggle for them to rethink everything they've ever been taught and who they are to recognize or to begin to open their mind to what you and I probably think of and know of when we think of the state of Israel. For them, it's absolutely inversed. And um, and it is it, it's a challenge to think of how to make that journey of discovery, of questioning, to open up a possibility to, to have doubt, to rethink some things that you take as truth. How do you do that without, um, without backlash, without alienating students so that they run in the opposite direction of um, meeting a student where they are and, and creating a situation to, that challenges them to see a different perspective? It has to be done with a certain kind of gentleness and sensitivity if you want to bring that student along. An activist might say, that's not my obligation. I'm speaking to a different, a different sector. There are some people, you know, uh, I'm not going to try to reach them. But as an educator, that person's in my classroom. My, my duty is to reach that person and, um, and not to shame them and not to alienate them. Um, but all, there's also an opportunity to bring everybody along depending on where they are. Um, and, and that might take that for me, my own approach is that has take, taken modification of some of the language and some of the concepts I might normally use or might want to use in my scholarship or might use in, in activism with, with in, in teaching, there's, um, uh, there's um, a certain tailoring that has to go to be effective with, with students, depending on where they're coming from. Wendy, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Um, it's a, a pleasure to speak to you and I hope you stay safe and I hope the people that you care about um, mm -hmm. stay safe too. Thank you so much for having me. Keep keep doing this great work. Thanks so much.